All right, welcome to the Florida Folk Show podcast Zoom interview with uh, David Amram, who's a famous American composer, arranger, conductor or of orchestral, chamber, and choral works, most of it with jazz flavorings. He uh, spent one year of his life uh, at Passa Grill Elementary School. Uh, I first met David. He just walked into the studio at WMNF one day unannounced. Apparently, he was driving by in a car, and uh, he was listening to the, to the radio and listening to the Florida Folk Show. And uh, I don't know what happened, but he wanted to go to the studio and uh, get on the show. He was doing a performance that evening down in Fort Myers. And uh, so <laughs> the guy driving him uh, drove him right up, and they knocked on the door, and he walked in and sat down. And I, I was just amazed because here's a guy that, uh, uh, you know, played with everybody from uh, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Willie Nelson, Bob Dylan, you name it, he's been there. And uh, folk and jazz music, and also he's famous uh, for uh, as an arranger of uh, movie scores, the, Man- the uh, Manchurian Candidate, Splendor in the Grass. Just go down the list. Uh, just a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, genius of a man, very, very uh, energetic, as you'll see. Uh, he will be 90 years old on um, uh, this November. And I first met him, and he walked on, onto the show, and then uh, um, we invited him because that, that very uh, week we were doing a Jack Kerouac night at the uh, uh, Flamingo Bar in St. Petersburg where Kerouac, uh, a St. Petersburg resident for, I think, seven or eight years uh, in, the, in the late uh, 60s, uh, lived right over there in the uh, Driftwood Heights uh, neighborhood. And uh, he came to the Flamingo to play pool. And so we, we on, on the anniversary of his death and his, uh, and his birth, uh, we always had a Jack Kerouac night, and we raised money to, to help uh, keep up the house. <clears throat> we, we had the keys to it, and we were trying to uh, fix it up. And uh, anyway, he showed up with uh, Eric Anderson, the famous folk singer uh, from the old days, who happened to be on the plane with him when he was flying down from uh, Upper State New York. And he told, uh, he called up Eric, and uh, who was also in town, and uh, Eric showed up too. And then we had Terry Plumeri there, who was a world-class uh, double bass uh, player that toured with Roberta Flack and uh, had also written many uh, movie, movies and uh, film and TV scores. So, so <laughs> amongst our gang of uh, ragtag musicians, we had these uh, three shining, shining uh, pros. And... Um, but he didn't have a David didn't have a piano. But uh, my daughter lived nearby, and, and her her daughter, my granddaughter Charlie, had a was was able to play the piano. So she had a little uh, mini electric piano, and I went over to the house and picked it up. And David played that little little piano, and uh, then we on the way back to taking him back to uh, where he was supposed to go that night to his hotel. I uh, stopped by to bring the piano back, and he 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 had signed the keys with his name. So. She was quite thrilled about that. Uh, really great guy. And uh, uh, so I hope you enjoy uh, David Amram, American composer. So I do the same thing with the mask. <laughs> well, you're not, uh, you're not outside or at, in a no. store, so it might seem kind of weird. I don't know. Um, okay. Let's let's go back and start over again and just just uh, tell you know can, tell us a little bit about your earliest remembrances. Okay, uh, go back all the way back to Paso Grill, Florida. Is that correct? Yeah, but I'll just start off by saying hi first, if that's okay. Okay. <clears throat> you tell me when to start. You 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 you're ready right now. Okay. Well, hi everybody. I'm David Amram, promising young composer, and. <laughs> It's great to be with you, Pete, and with all the people who love Jack Kerouac's writing, the Kerouac House, the Flamingo Bar, which you kept as a reminder to people that a great writer lived and loved St. Petersburg, Florida. And this was a place that I loved and lived in just for one year, from 1936 to 1937. My sister was in bad health at that time, and the doctor felt that would be the best place for her to be for a year, and she recovered and is still alive now in 
going to be 92 this September and still full of life. I'll only be 90 this November. I'm her younger brother. But we spent a wonderful year in Pasigrill Beach, Florida, which was part of St. Petersburg, 1936 to 1937. Recently, I went to Pasigrill after writing a book about my work with Jack Kerouac called Offbeat, collaborating with Kerouac. And at the St. Petersburg Fair, people said, well, we saw in the book that you went to first grade at the little public school in St. Petersburg down in Grill. We'd like to show you the old neighborhood. So I went back and of course, at the time I was there, it was all little tiny bungalows during the height of the depression. I remember we had scorpions under the house and my sister and I went barefoot to school, walked to school, and since they had no playground, for a recess, we swam in the ocean. I mean, how great could school be? I still think about that and all the schooling that I had at that time until I graduated from college. That was my favorite school year by far, and I still treasure it. And of course, when I took my little tour, the school had was long gone. There was just a little plaque. And I went, they said, well, show us where you used to live. And there were just these big mansions there. I said, well, gee, I, I, I saw one sort of small starter house. I said, well, that was like the biggest, like the biggest house that I can remember that was around at that time. Only not that elegant. And the person said, well, I think you could get it for $4 million. And I said, well, you know, maybe I'll just keep it in my memory. And I only mention that because for those people who were distressed because the house where Jack lived with his mom and with his wife, Stella, who in spite of misinformation written in many books of people who never knew Stella or Jack and was never given credit, she was an extraordinary person. And in fact, three weeks before Jack passed away, when I spoke to him, he said, you know, Stella's a saint. I got my ribs broken when I was punched out in the bar and Stella's taking care of me. She's taking care of my mother. And st after Jack passed away, Stella still looked after Jack's invalided mother until she passed away and took in sewing and worked knitting and did all kinds of jobs to help support Stella after Jack left us. Jack, as you know, passed away with only $83, but his books and the memory of his books and his legacy and the beauty that he found in that part of the West Coast of Florida and which I found as a little boy was there before any of us were born and is still there today and will always be there, just like Katrina didn't spoil New Orleans. And ever since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, the rents have been too high. Real estate has always been unfair. Men and women have always scuffled with one another, but life goes on. So for all people who love Jack Kerouac, we can appreciate all that you've done at the Flamingo Bar all those years and continue to do in terms of Jack's legacy. So rather than having anyone be upset about not having a Jack Kerouac skyscraper, a Jack Kerouac airport, or anything of that sort, we have his books and they have your bar, which was the place that Jack felt at home and loved. And that won't go away. So I think it's important for all of us to think about that, not be upset, by any business or real estate dealings that have nothing to do with Jack or his importance, but only have to do with the ever-changing world of finances. And I only say that not, not to be unrealistic, but to be really realistic. <laughs> we, we're honoring Jack for his literature, for his writing, for his spirit, for the inspiration that he continues to give new generations of people whom I'm glad to say 
when I meet them now, they say, oh, you're a new Jack Kerouac. They don't expect me to be a beatnik or a dependent personality professional victim as a classical composer or jazz musician or on my way to the cemetery since I'll be 90 this November and I'm scared <sighs> at that point. I only mention that because Jack himself medicated his hurt and his sensitivity by drinking because he never was comfortable in his role of suddenly overnight at the age of 35 becoming a worldwide figure that had nothing to do with the books that he wrote. He used to say to me over and over again, Davey, I'm a writer with that Lowell accent. I'm a writer, I'm an author. They don't read my books. He wasn't interested in any beat generation or being the leader of a non-existent literary yeah. movement. We were just all a bunch of friends that hung out with one another. And that included painters, poets, jazz musicians, moving men, waitresses, waiters, bar owners, and veteran hangoutologists who just wanted to have a good time <laughs> and see if there's something that they could do. And we were each other's 12 step program of people who hoped maybe we could do something in the arts and not be considered to be total nutcases or failures because we wanted to devote ourselves to doing something that we hoped would add to the repertoire of what was beautiful mm -hmm. that had been passed on to us and to celebrate the classics of European culture and the classics of Asian and African and Latin American and Native American cultures and the amazing picture of America, which was indescribable because it was so huge and vast and ever-changing. And this was a wonderful thing that Jack dealt with and captured in his work. So the Eastern Seaboard Establishment literary uh, leaders of the 1950s, all of whom felt that they were inferior because they weren't titled British lords and ladies, which is why the American Revolution took place 200 years ago to, to bypass that crap. All felt here's someone so generically American and so egalitarian and so warm to everyone, he couldn't possibly be anyone in the arts of any significance because he didn't act any differently than he was when he was a young man growing up. Pete Hamill, who just passed away, was the same way, in a different way. And a lot of the most wonderful artists whose work will endure never, as the, the Irish say, put on airs. Yeah. Jack never, never did that. And he was, in a certain way, misunderstood for that. Well, can you tell me a little bit about how uh, it came about that you and he played uh, you played the piano and he he uh, uh, he was reciting his poetry in Greenwich Village. I think you all were the first ones to do that, weren't you? Well, we were the first ones to give public, we called it music, poetry, poetry, music. Mostly we were just hanging out, having fun at parties until we were asked to knock it off. I met him at a bring your own bottle party and I was playing with Charles Mingus and I'd been playing with Mingus 55 and in 56, I met Jack at a bring your own bottle party where the painters, the artists would put their paintings 10 feet up in the air so they wouldn't have a drink spilled on them. And since they had the largest places at the lowest rents, they had BYOB, bring your own bottle parties. And everyone could bring a bottle of either Gallo wine or whatever was economical or Dr. Brown's black cherry soda if he wanted to avoid the hard stuff or a poem or a dance step or a story or some potato chips or just your own unadorned self. And at one of those parties, uh, this guy who looked like a Canadian lumberjack, they called him Boucheron in the French Canada, came up to me, handed me some paper and said, play for me because I had my little French horn with me, there was no piano there, and some penny whistles. 
which I always carried. And then he took the paper back before I could even see what it was. And he started reading. And I had no idea what he was reading, whether he made it up or if it was something translated from Victor Hugo, which he could recite in French and in English or whatever it was. It was terrific. I just got that feeling that I did when I was playing with Mingus or when I would go to Thelonious Monk's house or when I met Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker way before then. And they took me under their wing. I could just feel something and a lot of other people that no one's ever heard of who used to play with them or meet them and you just feel that connection. Then he ran off to chase some beautiful woman that he was bumped into. We were dancing and having fun. And the next week, and same thing, and another one of those bring your own bottle parties. And we started doing it more and more together. And it actually, then I, there was a place with a piano. So Philip Lamatia and Howard Hart, a year later said, you know, we, we've got to give a reading, but we're going to call it jazz poetry. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not just playing jazz, I'm playing music to fit the words. And Jack and I never rehearsed anything, we just did whatever the situation felt like at the moment with the idea, less is more, when in doubt, leave it out and honor the music that's already in the poetry or in the words. That's what Billy Collins told me. Years later, we did a reading in New Hampshire and he was there and he said, you know, David, I hardly ever use musicians because they always play too much. And he said, the music is already there in the poetry. So of course, when you're accompanying anyone, just as you try to do in life to be harmonious, you try to do what's appropriate. You follow the less is more, when in doubt, leave it out and honor what is already there and contribute to that rather than full greed ahead, hogatissimo, blow everybody off the face of the earth. That's a different kind of philosophy. And fortunately, the government that we've had the last four years proves that that type of narcissistic abuse of swinish behavior is a drag. And that pregnant silence means either I'm something <laughs> totally boring or profound. <laughs> Neither is important. The idea was that we tried to just make it beautiful. So suddenly, Philip Lamentia and Howard Hart said, we're going to have an official reading. So we went to the Bratta Art Gallery and gave the first ever public jazz poetry readings in New York City. Now, when I did a cantata with Langston Hughes years later in 1965, he said, you know, David, we did that during the Harlem Renaissance. And of course, none of us called it the Harlem Renaissance. That's what we were told it was afterwards. And not just as none of us called anything a beat generation that we were part of until it was on the cover of books and articles and magazines and that kind of thing. Uh, we just did what was came naturally. So we had jazz poetry, but Langston said, we did that at rent parties in the twenties and thirties. And people would get up and read everything from Shakespeare to something that they had written and we would have music <clears throat> to accompany that. This has been going, and of course, Homer did the Iliad and the Odyssey and you see all the old Greek vases, vases as they say, with pictures of someone reading and someone playing the lira, that was a little lap harp. The songs of Solomon apparently were always accompanied by a harp player. So this goes way, way back music and poetry and dance have always been related, always accompanied and part of the process of storytelling. And it's not that big a deal, but because of the fact that we did it and then On the Road came out, which miraculously got a staggering, phenomenal review, suddenly Jack was elevated into being the king of the beat generation, heaven help us and the avatar for a new culture, heaven help us. He'd spent 10 years or more writing that, actually more than almost 20 years writing the book 
starting from his adventures in 1947 through 1949, and then having the book rejected and rejected till he finally wrote the 10th version of On the Road. And in, in 2007, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the 1957 publication of a book that had chronicled something he began 10 years prior to that. And I only mention that because the, the mythology, the branding of the beach generation and the fact that he was supposed to be an ex-football player, moron, speed typist that took uh, Benzedrine in order to just hit the typewriter as quickly as possible was a, a great way of dismissing what he wrote. But the reality is he was an enormously prolific and serious writer. And now the younger generation of people that aren't interested in the beat generation, but do read his books, feel that he is an author. And so do the millions of people in the 30 languages the book's been translated into. And Jack himself loved literature and all the writers in different languages that he knew, including his contemporaries and read voraciously. He was like a real old fashioned artist. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's why his books have endured and why he inspires people to be creative, whether they wanna be a writer or just go out and take a camping trip or hang out with other people or listen to music or do anything besides sit at home in front of a television set and rot. What about uh, Pull My Daisy? And uh, was that actually a uh, almost a documentary, real, right, uh, of a real party, one of those parties that you were talking about? Yeah, well, actually, this was based on a three-act play that he wrote called The Beat Generation. And because oh. of the fact that he uh, had written a play with the title that someone named Zug Smith who is now vanished from history, but people could look him up on the internet, made one of the worst movies of the, of the century called The Beat Generation, which was so full of cliches and branding that it died the natural death that it deserved before it was a st stillborn as a grade Z movie. Not that I'm judgmental, but it really sucked. <laughs> and every, every cliche, that you could imagine, but the, he co-opted the title somehow. So Jack didn't change the title and the, the, the piece which supposedly was discovered in a warehouse, actually Sterling Lord, his agent for so long, had a copy of it. No one was interested in it. And some Alfred Leslie, a wonderful painter, and Robert Frank, who's a great still photographer, decided they'd like to make a movie. And Jack said, okay, I'm hoping they can make a movie of On the Road. And all readers of Jack who study his stuff will know that that famous letter that he sent to Marlon Brando saying Marlon Brando could be in it. And unfortunately, the movie never got made of On the Road. Maybe it's fortunate because the movie for On the Road still can be made and will be made again, where very simply, they just take what is in the book and make a movie out of it. It's not that hard. You read the book and you use as much of the book as possible. There, there was a movie made of it by a great, great filmmaker who rather than using what was in the book, ended up by having the actors make up their own dialogue because he didn't want to discredit anything that Jack Kerouac wrote. Well, the reality is you don't play an evening of box music by having music written by hack uh, <laughs> arrangers with ghostwriters and synthesizers stealing stuff from other people. You take what Bach wrote. And that wasn't that. And so On the Road will be done someday by some young person with an iPhone. And it'll be terrific because they'll love Jack Kerouac. And it's got to come from love and devotion to create anything of value. Anyway, that being said, the, the play lingered and never got done. And 40 some years after I 
was in Pull My Daisy. I not only composed the score, I was Mez McGillicuddy, the deranged French hornist. I saw the actual Mez McGillicuddy that Jack Kerouac wrote about, which was part of a third act of a wonderful play that Jack wrote. And they played at the Merrimack Theater, did it in Lowell, Massachusetts a few years ago. And I said, wow, it had so much terrific stuff in it. But the movie Pull My Daisy, we, we took a fraction of a party that was at Carolyn Cassidy's and Neil Cassidy, her husband, who was the real life hero of On the Road, had a little party where they invited a minister and his wife and daughter to come to visit them on an evening to have a dinner, and as normal people sort of did in the 1950s. And then a bunch of his friends came by and were so obnoxious that the minister and his wife and daughter couldn't stand it and all left. So that's kind of what that little fraction of the third act of a play was what they decided to make a documentary film about. Well, since the cast, except for wonderful Delphine Sirig, a great French actress who didn't speak English, but she didn't need to because there was a silent film that Jack was gonna narrate spontaneously. Everyone else, Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, Larry Rivers, myself, other people who were in it were not actors, which we proved by our non-performances. So 50 hours of stoned out infantile behavior and having a good time partying up a storm was edited down to 29 minutes by Leon, I think Leon Prochnik. He was a brilliant editor and worked for TV doing, I think, commercials and stuff like that. And Jack came in and saw it, put on some earphones. And I said, look, man, I'll play like we always do. And then I'll actually write a score afterwards where a lot of it will be silent so that they can hear your narration and, and sense what the story's about. But to, to make you comfortable, we'll just have it be like we did a jazz poetry reading and do everything spontaneously. So he did the whole narration spontaneously. I was there. It's the only time we ever put on earphones or even planned anything remotely. And I was overwhelmed. At the very beginning, they showed the inside of that filthy studio that Alfred, God bless him, Alfred Leslie had. And he said, early morning in the universe, wife gets, I said, wow, it just got goosebumps. It was so, somehow, when he saw that first film flash, he transformed everything into a movie in itself, his narration. At Columbia Records wanted to put out just Jack's speaking and my music. And we almost did it. And finally, three years later, fifth, almost 60 years after we <laughs> originally did it, it's, it's now on, came out for the first time as part of a five CD box set of all my music used in films for the last 60 years. But with the film, because of Jack's narration, it was distributed later on, or, or they made an attempt to distribute it with another wonderful film called Shadows by John Cassavetes, who was a real filmmaker and had real actors. And all of us who saw the film, including those of us who were in Pull My Daisy, all were thrilled that we could be in the company of a John Cassavetes movie because he was a terrific filmmaker. And his film was really a terrific film that we all admired. Pull My Daisy is a wonderful document because so many of the people who were in it got much better known and appreciated later on and people could see us in our 20s of guys and gals that were now in their, well, I'll be 90 in, in a few weeks, were somewhat older or no longer here or incompamentous, which means totally out of it. So in a certain way, it was historic in that regard, but the real reason why anybody even paid any attention to it was because of Jack's extraordinary narr spontaneous narration and Robert Frank's amazing filming. 
even though he was a still photographer, essentially, he had that eye of catching what seemed to be of no value and somehow framing it to a place where it was actually quite beautiful on repeated viewings and hearings. It was fun to work on and it's nice to see that finally it's available. I say finally because Robert Frank and Alfred Leslie had tremendous feud as to whose film it actually was. And like the Sunshine Boys, they had a feud going for the rest of their lives. Finally, their lawyers said, look, you could have a joint copyright. So after <laughs> almost 50 years, there was Robert Frank's Pull My Daisy and Alfred Leslie's Pull My Daisy, and they were both the same film. And now it's on YouTube, now everybody can see it. And now finally the recording has come out with the, uh, just the music and his voice. So people listening to that can make their own movie just by listening to Jack's amazing narration. And you get a sense of what it was like to hang out with him because he was just wrapping up a storm. Well, that's a, that's a good history of that. Uh, I didn't know uh, much, much about that background there. Well, I, think, I don't think anybody does because first of all, it was ignored. And then the people that wrote about it tried to uh, compare it to the work of Truffaut and, and all these wonderful filmmakers of the time, but it was just done for us as a home movie so we could show our kids and grandkids that we weren't just a bunch of stumbled bums, stoned out, self-loathing, mediocre creeps, uh, but rather we were just all friends having a good time and hoped that we could show other people that we wanted to be doing something. As some, Larry David, I believe it was from Seinfeld said, the, Seinfeld was a, we called a television program about nothing and became a big hit. And one of the things that inspired us just to do that was the film Pulled My Daisy, which was a film about nothing. And of course, <laughs> just a film about everyday life is the best thing anybody can do and, and telling a story that people can relate to. And my hope is that all the young people who like it now with their iPhones, if nothing else, they can take their iPhone if they can't afford a studio or they can't, they don't want to go out and raise money and have GoFundMe operations for 10 years and then never get it distributed. They can make the film with their friends, get good musicians and composers and songwriters that they know get a good story and make their own film and they can put it up on YouTube or something and you can do the whole thing for free and bypass that whole industrial system. And that's, in my opinion, that does not make the whole industrial system worthless. It means it can make the whole industrial system better because rather than the dog wagging the tail, the tail can now inspire the dog to a higher level. <laughs> wow. just, so, just as your Flamingo Bar and something honoring Kerouac to get people to read his books will inspire a lot of people to honor other artists in their own community, inspire everybody that has a bar or a restaurant to have a poet come in and read some poetry or a painter come in and show their paintings mm -hmm. or a local musician to come in and play. And there are places that do that all over the world. So that's not such a radical idea. And the idea of trying to franchise everything into a boom or bust philosophy is what killed the music industry and they used to blame it on Napster, then they blamed it on a whole generation of people that didn't want to buy records. It never occurred to all the people who were involved in that, that they were doing the same thing that the makers of the Titanic did. Too big, too fast, too much of an ego trip, and not serving the needs of the passengers. So the music industry, by not serving the needs of the customers, shot itself in the foot, but they didn't 
end music. They ended the misrepresentation and industrialization of music uh, controlled by people who never learned to sing or dance and didn't know anything about it. And that's why when you go on YouTube or you go on all these other places, you could see these fantastic musicians of all ages from little kids to people older than me. There are some of them still alive and people that we've never heard of who are f incredible, including people from the past and people who are doing it now all over the world. And that's a good thing. So for, for people who say, well, that's nice to have that hot air philosophy, but don't you realize you're leading people down the wrong path by indicating by in, in, indicating that there can be more art when there's too much art and not enough of a market. I humbly say that there are never too many sunsets and never enough beauty. Okay. You know, I wanted to ask you because you have played with so many different uh, musicians. You, you've been a sideman. Uh, in addition to being a composer, you've uh, been on recordings with people as varied as, you know, Willie Nelson, uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, you've had reactions. Who, who's the most fascinating person that you've been around in a musical situation? I would think, well, Charlie Parker, certainly. I met him in 1952. I still think about him every day. And Dizzy Gillespie, who I met in 1951 and Monk and Sonny Rollins, whom I still stay in touch with, who's going to be 96 weeks before me. And just, and he said, you know, David, people are so conscious now about the misadministration and the, and the COVID, they forget about the golden rule. He said, that's, I can't walk anymore very well. I don't play the saxophone anymore but I've never been happier because I follow the golden rule every day. He said, the body, we all turn to dust, but the spirit lives forever. And I said, wow, because he was a very spiritual person. When I met him in 1955, and was playing up a storm and the toast of the town, so to speak, among musicians. He still had that beautiful commitment to a higher power than staring in the mirror. And he was always been that way. And, and Monk and, and Dizzy and Charlie Parker, you couldn't have found three more different people, but they all had that extra spiritual thing. So did Rudolf Serkin, the great concert pianist, uh, Dimitri Metropolis, the great conductor whom I dedicated my first book, Vibrations to, was that way. And so many other people playing with Willie Nelson. When you play with Willie, you just get that feeling that he exudes all of those people had that same ability to capture something beyond what it was supposed to be and make it memorable and make it classical. And the right Jack was that way and a lot of other people that no one ever heard of. So many people. And I searched for that and it's something that I'm still trying to attain a level of myself. And I think that that's the important thing for all of us to go for. And none of those people, Sir James Galway, the phenomenal flutist, I was lucky enough to have him ask me to write a concerto for him. And I said, Sir James, I said, Sir Jimmy, <laughs> Sir Jimmy. It's amazing how when we do concerts with the different orchestra, you hang out with everyone in the orchestra, you hang out with all the flute players, you're nice to every single person that comes by and afterwards and asks you or speaks to you. You never snub anybody. He said, well, he said, the part of Ireland I came from, he said, we don't endorse putting on airs. And I love that. And I mentioned that because I think the whole rock and rollization of our culture has, has proven not to be that successful or long living. And people who involve themselves in that way have a constitutional right to act as they please. But the true great people were on a higher level and also down home approachable for real and realize that there's 
we all have a responsibility not to dump on anyone. And, and this is not anything that's particularly original. And that goes against the grain of the full greed ahead. Um, one, the people are talking about 1%. Things have always been that way. And there's no elite in the arts or life. There are people who are accomplished and admirable and we can look up to them. And conversely, they're supposed to give all of us a helping hand so we can do what we can do better. And that's our gig. And that's what we're here to do. And that's what we're supposed to do. And I've met enough people who do that to make it possible and to be able to deal with anything. When we did the concert for you and they couldn't get a piano, you got your granddaughter's little electric piano and Eric Anderson was saw on the plane who loved Kerouac's writing, came from his gig and we played all night. I'll never forget that evening. If you had some career counselor or manager or person who supposedly was know how to put on an event, that's the last thing they would ever suggest. Go in front of the Flamingo Bar, play on a tiny stage and all those people who we played with that night were so terrific and the whole evening was so much fun and I got to go even see the Kerouac house afterwards about two o'clock in the morning. It was a beautiful night, I'll never forget. And you were responsible for that. And the fact that you've had those little celebrations for years says a whole lot about what it's really about. And in my humble opinion, Jack would have loved every second of that and felt at home. And he would have stayed up. I finally had to bail out at 5.30. He would have been up till <laughs> the middle of the next day enjoying every second of it. <laughs> what about Ramblin' Jack? Have you ever had interactions with him? Oh yeah, he's one of my favorite people of all time. We, he came to visit me once out at the beach in 1960, 1967. No, no, I beg your pardon, 1969, 1970. I met him, we knew each other since 1960, but he finally came out and he said, I want to come out for the weekend and he stayed 31 days. <laughs> and I was sorry to see him go. And, and we even played, he even played on some of my records. And I remember he came into RCA. I was with the classical Red Seal department and they made a record called No More Walls. But he said, look, you've done so much stuff. We're going to have it be a double album, one of all jazz and folk music compositions that you have based on music from around the world where you play all your instruments and one of a straight classical one where you're conducting symphony orchestra. So I did the, all the symphony stuff and then I did all the jazz programs but the Peter Munvey said look you've got to get one kind of a real folk piece. So I said okay I'll get Jack Elliott. So Jack came in with his dog Caesar. He had this gigantic dog and he came right into RCA classical studio, Studio A, where they record the symphonies with his dog Caesar wearing his immaculate cowboy outfit, which he spent the whole day primping up to get it just right. And Peter Munvies heard him play the guitar and yodel at me. And after 30 seconds, he said, this is the most fantastic person I've ever seen in my life. I wonder if we could sign him up. Well, Anybody I guess would sign up Jack, except he wasn't interested in, the, in his dog needed something to eat and Jack never came back to see him. So, But we do have the record called Going North. And when we sat out, I remember I practiced with him the entire time and he just played a pattern and I played some little stuff on top of it. It was really, and then the other one that I made with him was Home on the Range with Odetta singing with the Afro-Cuban band and that was in 1978, I think we made that. And we couldn't get Jack. So we held up the record for almost a year till he could come in and do his little yodeling and guitar playing in the very beginning, sort of starting off like a, like a cowboy piece and then going into all the other phases of that great range of music that we're all supposed to be home of. And he was just a wonderful guy and so much fun and so enjoyable. That's how that famous song, Peanut Butter Sandwich Jelly with Jam, one for me and David Amram got written. It was because in 1970, I was at CBC 
doing a whole series of programs in Canada and Toronto. And Jack was playing in Toronto. He said, David, he said, come on, man. He said, I wasn't married then. I didn't have kids. He said, come on, stay over, crash out where I'm staying and play with me at the, at the Gaslight, this little place that he played. I was to know is that this submarine, we called it the submarine. That wasn't the name of it. It was a place in, in, in Yorkville, which was sort of the Greenwich Village of 1970 Toronto, Bernie Fiedler's place. And this guy named Raffi used to come down every night because he was a Jack Elliott fanatic, as so many singer songwriters and guitar flat pickers were and still are. And I was playing, we go over to Raffi's house afterwards and play all night long till Raffi's wife, who had a regular job to support him, would get up. And, and he worked hard, but he, he only got one or two gigs on the weekends. And she said, fellas, I think it's time for you to go home. I have to go to work. So then we would leave and sleep all day while she was working. And years later, my kid, I got married, my kids went to school. My daughter said, Daddy, there's a guy singing about you on the record. I said, what? He said, yeah, Raffi. I said, what? So she brought me a copy of the record and there was the song, Peanut Butter Sandwich Jelly with Sham, one for me and one for David Amram. And then, then she turned on the Disney Channel, I think it was, the song was played all the time. So I said, I gotta call up Raffi and thank him. That was the only thing that ever impressed my kids was being on that record. So I said, Raffi said, how are you, man? I said, I just wanna thank you, Raffi, for the only thing that ever impressed my kids was being on your song. How can I ever thank you? And he said, well, he said, I had to finish the song. And he said, and I couldn't think of anything to rhyme with jam. So sometimes you luck out, but it was Jack Elliott that that happened. Otherwise, I never would have met Raffi or, and yeah. would have written the song. I can tell you a, a, a weird, uh, the, the, one of the funniest things I've ever seen is I, I stopped in to see him in California and we went out to dinner and his wife at the time, Ramblin' Jan, you know. Oh, yeah. She was in the front seat and I was in the back seat. and. Uh, he, he we got up to the restaurant and he kept going round and around the restaurant and she's saying jack why don't you park there and he didn't say anything and he's he's waiting for a spot that was right right next to the the, the building he kept going <laughs> round and round she says what the hell are you doing jack and he, go, he looks up at her he goes uh, he finally sees a spot and he pulls in and he says cowboy never walks when he can ride <laughs> <laughs> I remember that my whole life. <laughs> I've purposely done that before, just so I could say that line. <laughs> well, you know, Jack was was from Manhattan Beach, yeah. out in New York. Elliot Adnipose, but he always, as all of us in the East Coast did, dreamed of being a cowboy because we all saw those wonderful movies during the Depression of the singing cowboys on horses chasing women and, and uh, playing the guitar and singing as well as possible. And I think he really dreamt of that and he joined a rodeo. I remember he took me to Madison Square Garden when the rodeo was there. He spent about two hours making sure that everything was dressed correctly. And when we went back during intermission, all those old cowboys, rodeo people, remember Jack and loved him. And he had become that. He used to say sometimes, I would like to do that, David, but it's against my cowboyology religion. And he, he worked so hard at that, that he, be, instead of being Elliot Adnipose, he was rambling Jack Elliot. He became that. And it just shows if you work hard enough, anybody can do anything. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, is not a direct descendant of the Bach family. So what? He spent his whole life playing those beautiful unaccompanied Bach solos. And when you hear Yo-Yo Ma do that, you could feel Bach coming right through him. And anybody can do anything, but they have to realize that they have to devote their life to it and have respect, especially if it's a culture you're not born into it, you have to have respect for it. And now people from all over the world can get to know one another and share 
in what they're doing. And that's different. That's a lot different, Pete, than the idea of fusion or crossover or blending or watering down or making relevant something that already has been relevant maybe for thousands of years. It's already beautiful. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So you try to learn about it. And maybe then you can contribute something to it. But you don't go with the idea of saying, okay, we're going to take this and repackage it so that it will be potable or saleable to a new generation and then destroy it in the process. And Jack's an example now of someone who has a lot of people who are from that culture or cultures of the West, old cultures, who were born into that check out what their parents and grandparents showed them and get into that as well as everything else. All the heritages are precious. Every culture, every religion, every race, every person is precious and they're all worthy of study and respect and sharing. So that gives you a good picture in your life what to do. And of course, if you do that, you might not make as much money it might take you a lot longer to get out there, but you do something more valuable and you'll have a much better time in life and more fun living that way. Between all those scuffles and struggles, you'll have some glorious moments because you'll be around some really fine people. Well, you certainly have been around some of the, the biggest group of fine people I've ever known anybody to be around. And uh, it's, uh, those are, that's a good uh, philosophy there. And I appreciate you. Uh, you're, you're one of those fine people, man. And that's why I'm so glad <laughs> just to talk to you because you actually did something for Jack that uh, I don't believe anybody else yet has done. You're taking a part of his life that was important and honoring that in a fun way. And I've, I've never, except for the one time I did that program for you, I've never been there, but even seeing it on, on the web, <laughs> and photographs touches my heart because that's something Jack would have loved himself and something that he came out of. Well, it's my, uh, my great pleasure and honor to, to do that. And uh, we're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep moving on. We are just going in a different direction now. And uh, hopefully we'll get a big old plaque up uh, just like your school there. We'll have a plaque saying, you know, Jack Kerouac lived at St. Pete and, and also there's places like Haslam's bookstore where he used to walk down in his bedroom slippers at Kimonas every day. And Mr. Haslam's grandson, I believe it was, the same person you spoke to, said, uh, no, Jack used to come in and his books weren't selling that much towards the end. So we had him on the bottom shelf and all the hot books up on the top shelf. He would come in and rearrange the books every yeah. day without saying a word. And then we would go, we would put the books back where they were supposed to be he never confronted us about it and we never confronted him. And that went on. And Mrs. Haslin, his, who one of the original owners, had been a teacher at the school that I went to in 1937. She was already oh. in the 80s and she was a senior citizen champion scuba diver. And, and she said, David, she said, you were in the first grade. I taught the third grade. I never had you. And she remembered, she remembered all of those different students. Wow. They all appreciated Jack as, as a person that he was, and they knew he was kind of down on his luck, but they could see his sweetness and kindness and, and the fact that he still cared about books and the fact that he was gracious to other people. And he apparently came there every single day. And there are all kinds of stories of that. And Ronnie Lowe, who's, who some of your pe people, older people, certainly who had the Ronnie Lowe and the Domino, as they called it. He was uh -huh. the first integrated band before there was a thing called integration. When I played in Florida with Oscar Pettiford's band, the, even though segregation had been outlawed, it was still segregated. We played at Florida A&M and we had to stay in all, all the black hotels because there were only three white guys in this big band. And I remember taking, going across the, when we took the, through Alligator, <clears throat> you know, the famous 
crossroad that, that went through Alligator Alley. The bus driver said, look, boys, he said, everybody knows me so that even though I'm a white cat, but he said, you two white boys in the back there, when you get down past a certain point, you better keep your head down below the window because if they see you sitting there with all your black brother musicians, they might get upset and you know you might not have a head anymore. So <laughs> sure enough, we Ed London, another French horn player, because Julius Watkins couldn't make it, and my oh, had our head down, and all the guys in the band said, "Hey Dave, get up there, an alligator, get up!" They were make they were laughing at us because we didn't didn't want to upset anybody. And in that kind of an environment, Ronnie Lowe had his band called the Dominoes and he never was a big loud mouth. He also, he wrote for the African-American newspaper and his nom de plume, his writing name was capital I, capital B, black, I, B, black. And that was, that was Ronnie Lowe. He was a pretty amazing cat and a wonderful, wonderful person, wonderful musician, and a great friend to Jack in the last year or two. And he described in detail, even as Jack was down on his luck, how Stella would hide his shoes so that he wouldn't go out hanging out with all these guys, but he would come out in bedroom slippers or, or barefoot and be the life of the party and stay up later and, and make those guys feel they were older than he was and, and described his energy and his zest and his love of music and how much fun he was to be with. He painted a whole different picture of what Jack was about. And I just wish Ronnie had lived long enough yeah. to be able to tell other people about that. And now I'm sure there are people to know him where they can start to acknowledge Ronnie Lowe as one of the people from that era when Jack lived at the end of his life. And of course, Jack spent 12 years in Florida. So when I would go to the Eastern Seaboard Establishment, international super hip movie as their party piano player or their promising young middle-aged composer in residence for the time being, and I would talk about my great-grandfather coming to as an immigrant to Savannah, Georgia, and how much I love being in the South, as well as Greenwich Village and the North. And I would mention Florida, they say, oh, Florida, that's where people go to die. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, a lot of people go there to live. And I said, Jack was one of those people. And a lot of other people go there. And I said, if you go down South, I said, if you can suspend your prejudice that everyone south of the Mason-Dixon line is a congenital, moron, toothless, uneducated idiot, perhaps you'll find something beautiful that you never knew existed and see that a lot of that beautifulness also is right from this part of the country. And I don't know why that is, but there's a certain thing Thang is the way it's pronounced, T-H-A-N-G. There's a certain thing that's very beautiful, and that's part of the tapestry of America that makes this such an amazing country. I talked to Ronnie Elliott about that just a few days ago. He's from down your way, and he's one of those people. I said, Ronnie, man, just to see you every time you smile, boy, that brings in some sunshine into the room. And there's so many terrific artists and musicians and one of the greatest composers of the 20th century um, who wrote the opera S Susanna, which was a big Carlisle Floyd and a lot of other operas, was offered all kinds of jobs in New York where he could have been Mr. You know, become Mr. Big Shot. And he, he was from the South, he, he stayed in Florida. Then he taught at Baton Rouge, Louisiana and he wrote some of the greatest music of the, of the 20th century, the most beautiful operas. And there's so many jazz and folk and blues musicians and poets and writers, good Lord, without Truman Capote and Thomas Wolfe and Eudora Welty and, and Langston Hughes and people who came from the South, many of them moved up north and Zora Neale Hurston and 
army of other spectacular William Styron, so many phenomenal writers, not to mention all the young cats and kitties. Without that, we wouldn't have much of a, of a culture. And I only mention that because there's people assume that there's a, that if it's south of the Mason Dixon line, it's second rate. And that's pathetic, limited thinking. And of course, in, in the political sense, they forget the fact that when our great leader is saying we should leave, leave all those Confederate <laughs> flags up, the state of Mississippi themselves, not, not uh, somebody trying to get on TV to sell t-shirts, but the, the governing people in Mississippi themselves said they don't want that anymore because they don't really need that. And there's a difference between Southern pride and cultural heritage yeah. and history and the beauty parts of, of the South than there is with, with the politics or slavery. And the, the whole politicization, the, the, the politics involved in that are pretty amazing to the point where they can say the only, only person left who's still fighting for the Confederacy is someone from Queens, born in Queens, New York, <laughs> tried to crash his way into the Manhattan society and they didn't want anything to do with him or his father who were convicted slum lords yeah. and therefore they he had to grovel by trying to scrape up the roots of, of what happened 150 years ago and act as if the civil war was a mistake and and that's a oversimplification but art and music and poetry transcend all of that crap you know and jack, you forgot. Did, and jack loved the north and he loved his hometown of Lowell, Massachusetts, which was considered to be second race compared to Boston. And he loved St. Petersburg, Florida, and he loved Denver, Colorado, and he loved wherever he was because he saw the, the beauty part. You know who you left out when you were naming all the uh, songwriters, composers, Stephen Foster. Oh my Lord, how about that? Talk about a stone genius, Woo. good Lord. Uh, is that music of his ever beautiful? The old folks at home, known uh, around uh, the world. Uh, every every song of his is just just classic, and and I left out so many people. If I mentioned all the all the songwriters <laughs> and all the blues singers, and and I, I'll never we'd forget. On, we'd be on for hours. Yeah, I'll never f forget the. Before he wrote the song about, or before he started work with the Dolphins, he'd written this written the song that was on a B side, that was used in Midnight Cowboy. Fred Neal, yeah. and he sang with a wonderful singer, who 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 unfortunately passed away with Vince Martin. Yeah, and they had and Vince sang like an angel, and and I knew. I, I spent a whole night with Fred before he left his place in New York one night. And he was just such a beautiful cat and such a great songwriter, such a great singer. And he said, no, man, he said, I'm, I'm going home. He said, New York's great. He said, with the Midnight Cowboy, suddenly he was getting royalties for, the, for, for a song that wasn't one of his favorites. That was the B side of, of something that he made. And, and he went and he did all that great work with the Dolphins. The Dolphins, and, yeah. And when I was at the University of the Frost School of Music, again, recently with, when I was down there, my Lord, they got an orchestra and a chorus. And I was at the, all the schools and colleges I've been to in, in, in Florida and in, in St. Not only St. Petersburg, but in, in so many of the other parts of the, of the state just amazing the and the the beauty of that place is just over overwhelming and i could hardly wait to get back i was supposed to do a concert with in sarasota with dick hyman one of the giants of the music world at the opera house and because of, of the covid like everything else we were canceled and 
I think till December and they'll probably cancel it again, and make it next spring. But to me, just coming back to do anything is, is a special, special treat. And I, I think it's wonderful that what you're doing now is a first step towards honoring Jack in a different way. So rather than people, rather than dwelling on what happened, that's a business world. And the business world goes on and continues. When I was in Rome, I said, man, I'm gonna get a real Roman authentic pizza. And I went up to this place, this guy had a little pizza stand. Boy, it smelled great, right on top of this huge stone. And I had to sort of climb up this little stairway ladder to get there. And I noticed the stone, I said, man, that looks like a big toe and part of a foot. So I, I spoke a little Italian and he said, no, no, I said, that was a foot of one of the big shots. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's all that's left. Just part, of, I said, my Lord, if that was just his foot, his big toe and part of his foot, imagine how tall a statue must have been. Talk about Mr. Egomaniac and all that was left was part of his toe, but the pizza tasted delicious. So I said, well, I guess that guy's egomania. We still got his toe, but more important, we got a pizza stand celebrating some good eats and nourishment and life. So I think sometimes we can do something small and have it be of real value. So anything that you guys do this on a small, would seemingly be on a small level, could turn out to be pretty hip and very nutritious. David, thank you very much. Well, I thank you. And in all this time uh, talking with us here, we're going to put this all together and I'll give you a call whenever we get it onto the, uh, the podcast. Great. And my hope is that people who are watching it, if, if you're a writer, a singer, a poet, a musician, a carpenter, a plumber, an astronaut, or just want to get out of the house and do something besides be depressed because you don't think you're doing what you're told you're supposed to do or you're supposed to be. Maybe they'll think, maybe they'll read a few pages of Jack's books. Or if you're living in St. Petersburg, you say, man, I got all these amazing people here. Maybe I don't have to come to New York City and live in a rat hole for 30 years or go to Los Angeles or go to some big place and uh, suffer and struggle so I can be something. I can be at home because this place where I'm at home is a pretty beautiful place too. And, and I think that's the thing that we're going to see more and more of and that you can now in today's world be a creative person or a meaningful person or a happy person or an adventuresome person wherever you live and to make wherever you live even nicer by trying to put out a little of that niceness yourself. All right. Thank you very much. And for any of my classmates from the first grade of Pastor Grill, 1936-37, it's almost time for us old people to go to sleep. We got to stay awake and make this place hipper than ever. <laughs> <laughs> I take off my hat, but the thing is I haven't had a haircut since March 8th when COVID struck. I've been... <laughs> more like a solitary nerd. So I'll, I'll get next time you, I see you, I'll have a haircut. I had one the other day and I had to wear the mask the whole time. I said, well, how are you going to trim around my ears? You know, well, very carefully, you know. Ah, well, you look looking good. 